Obviously, a few topics today we'll be getting into is banks and whether or not you can short sell them in the future, what that might look like. We'll drive into the global aspect of where the banking sector is going and throw a little bit of Bitcoin stuff in there, all for you guys today. Again, welcome back in. My name is Paul Barron and this is TechPath. Let's jump into it. And of course, this is a guest that we've had on our show many times, and that is Mr. Greg Foss. Great to have you back. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Greg, so let's get into a few things here. I want to go primarily in the financial sector, your history and expertise in this, well known in the industry. But I want to go into a couple of things. One right here is this Kobalisi topic right here. We'll talk about Fed ex uh, expectations are shifting a little bit. Markets now seeing possibly a 31% chance of a rate cut in July. Um, base case shows maybe three 25 basis cuts this year beginning in September. Uh, it's time to deal with the aftermath of these, you know, these crazy numbers that we've seen. My question to you is, do you think we will see a rate cut this year at the current state of what the Fed's doing? I actually do. Um, I don't put a whole lot of faith in those, uh, those uh, uh, expectations. They're quite thin markets. They're very uh, fickle. But uh, just based on um, uh, economic... Uh, indicators and, and the like, and the likelihood, the high likelihood that we will see some sort of credit contagion. I believe that at least one rate cut by December. So I'm hedging my bets okay. quite a bit, but a lot of people say no rate cuts all year. I'm, I'm on the other side of that. I think there'll be a nominal rate cut and QE infinity. That's the more important thing is that right. they open up the, they open up the printing press again. So this may be, and I, two points there I want to unpack there, and one will be credit and what that looks like for American consumers kind of going in, what that means for even regional or mid-sized banks. But let's go over to the QE thing. And when you look at uh, quantitative easing and what we've already seen in the past, printing multi-trillions, uh, obviously due to you know a pandemic, but the idea behind that you're saying that we could even one up that in terms of the amount of potential we have to. here for so it's, yeah, it's we have to it's going to be better it's, than it's, the last one. No, it's just simple mathematics. I mean, we have gotten to a point where the debt spiral, the total global debt, and I'm just fo I won't just focus on the United States. It's not mm -hmm. in isolation. Uh, the total global debt numbers are so large that the organic growth of the debt because of the coupon will exceed the organic will, will will exceed the growth of global gdp to an extent that the interest expense makes the debt expand the only way of solving that is by printing yeah yeah what are it's your thoughts math. on it's, this it's, yeah, yeah you ahead. look at the numbers i mean eventually this just goes into oblivion and and you yeah. have every country that has been devalued in terms of their monetary system out there as terms of a blueprint for how this might end up whether it takes Five years, ten years, or twenty years, we're yeah, we're much on faster way. than that. Much faster than that because we had okay. a chance of escaping it prior to the COVID response, but now it's mathematically impossible. And then when you're running seven percent annual deficit, right. so seven percent of GDP annually, that global in this case of the United States, that just adds to the expansion of the debt balloon. Greg, how do you see this? Because there are a few people talking about the Great Reset and. Many people would look at this and say, all right, the G20s get together, they come in, they say, all right, we're going to create a global you know, digital currency, whatever that might look like, and reset the whole, the whole game table. Is that even possible of, of when you look at analysts kind of going this direction, many people just simply say, we'll continue to devalue the monetary system. Now you're starting to see a bit of a shift in many countries around the world starting to go with their own currencies in terms of trade. Obviously, with China, we just saw some things with India and even Pakistan, Iran, mostly in the Middle East. What are your thoughts about that in the terms of a reset and or an alternative uh, reserve? Well, let's be clear. So um, there's lots of ways of uh, the, the terminology, but, um, you know, all fiat's debase, Paul. That is just the math. Yep. And they are relative. So... They're all debasing, just the rate of decay is different between certain nations, depending on things like, right. obviously, interest rates and trade deficits. But they're all debasing. So we know that for sure. 
Some are debasing faster than others to enhance their uh, uh, competitiveness in a global market. It's called beggar thy neighbor. If you debase your currency more quickly, the currency makes your exports more attractive. And as you know, GDP is measured as follows. GDP equals consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports. So that net exports fourth term is quite a, you know, it could be a, uh, well, it's it's a term that they can play with, with a debasement of the currency makes their exports more mm -hmm. uh, attractive. That being said, a CBDC is nothing more than a digital fiat. Yeah. So if you're doing it with analog fiat, you're going to do it with digital fiat. Yeah. Now the digital fiat comes with an added bonus of surveillance and monitoring and, Oh, Mr. Foss, you spent your, uh, money on, uh, on uh, a parade, uh, sorry, at a restaurant on a parade route that, uh, we don't agree with. So you were obviously attending that parade. Uh, we're going to censor your, uh, your CBDC or right. let's take it to another extreme. Mr. Foss, you're a fat man. You're a fat. So, we are going to limit your carb, your uh, your caloric intake because we've seen that you're shopping too much at a restaurant. You know, all of these things are possible. Let's not go there. The reality is, though, whether it's an analog fiat or a digital fiat, they're all they're all going down. I mean, let's not overthink things. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think if you look at, I mean, if you look at that and you think, all right, this is a dystopian future around where the monetary system might go. Obviously, the decentralization of what we've seen in the crypto markets, Bitcoin, et cetera, possibly have a solution for that. Granted, in the short term, there's going to be a lot of money to be made. There's going to be a lot of investment opportunity that's going to create in all sorts of markets, whether you're in gold, you're in Bitcoin, you're in other digital assets. Uh, one of the things that I looked at here, this was from Zero Hedge, the reason behind the bank crisis in one chart, Fed has never once tested banks for higher interest rates in 14 years of stress Correct. tests. So this is new. We're getting ready to face that. Obviously, we've already seen the flight of capital going to money market reserves, uh, which is not banks, just so everybody's clear. That's a security. Um Moving to a money market reserve, which is now we're starting to see most of the time or here recently, it's been mostly money market manager or money managers, a lot of maybe institutional finance and maybe corporate treasures starting to say, all right, we're going to pull out of banks, push over here. But now you're starting to see this on mom and pop. At some point, the money market is going to dry up with a reversal. At what time when that occurs? Where do people move money at that time when money markets start to lower in interest? Banks no longer have the ability to pay interest rates. Do you feel like that might be digital assets, Bitcoin, gold, et cetera? Oh, certainly other assets. I don't think, uh, you know, it'll go back to zero interest rate policy that we've been through. So let's address that zero hedge uh, uh, yep. chart. Uh, interest yep. rates have been on a one-way decline not for the last 14 years, but for the last 40, four zero years. When I started mm -hmm. trading in the late 80s, interest rates were double digits, okay? Yep. And essentially, they've gone down. And when they go down, uh, bond prices go up. As you know, that's the, uh, the price interest relationship in bonds. When the Bank for International Settlements created in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, primarily, I guess, early 90s, the Bank for International Settlements capital guidelines, they were focused solely on credit risk, okay? Uh, interest rate risk was not a huge focus for them. Uh, banks are viewed to be lenders, and the largest risk in lending is credit risk, not interest rate risk, because most loans don't have the duration of long-dated treasury bonds. But you see, Paul, in that, Long dated treasury bonds had a capital requirement of zero, which means a bank could take your deposits mm -hmm. and lend, essentially lend to the U.S. Treasury, short term deposits lending to 30 year treasury bonds. As long as interest rates go down, that 30-year bond goes up in price. Everything's hunky-dory until right. interest rates go up and that bond price goes down. And that's yeah. what we're living through right now. So 
correct, they haven't measured for it from a capital allocation, doesn't mean that risk didn't exist. It's just that the regulators were focused on other things. And by the way, they barely had enough capital to cover their credit risk exposure. The, the regulators didn't want to bring in interest rate ex risk exposure. It would have required all the banks to go out and raise more equity capital, dilute their shareholders and cause, you know, a uh, 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 ceiling on bank stocks. That was not their goal. The, the capital guidelines were largely, and I worked on the capital guidelines for Canada's largest bank, uh, Royal Bank of Canada in the early 90s. They were reverse engineered. The right. banks had a certain amount of capital and the BIS regulator said, well, let's reverse engineer these credit guidelines so that you already keep the amount of capital that's on the bank's balance sheet. It's such a goofy system. It really is pathetic. And it was largely a response to the Latin American debt crisis in the late 80s that they brought these BIS capital guidelines in. Guess what? Now we're living the regional banking crisis. Same problem. Right. Though they're equity capital has been carved because of interest rate risk. And we haven't even started contemplating the impacts of commercial real estate and real credit risk. It's not yeah, good. Yeah, CRE is going to be the one that I think is the true uh, Trojan I agree. Horse and so does Warren that, Buffett. So does yeah. Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. And those guys, I'm, I don't always agree with them, but they're sucking and blowing right now, Paul. They're saying, <laughs> oh, Jay Powell, Jay Powell yeah. did a great job. He's done a great job. And then they say, yeah, we're selling bank stocks because banks are undercapitalized. Why yeah. are they undercapitalized, fellas? Well, because Jay Powell raised interest rates so darn yeah. quickly. Uh oh, so he did a great job, but you're selling banks because banks are undercapitalized. I mean, these clowns are, they're past the best before date, okay? Stop yeah. <laughs> listening to those people. They're conflicted. It's crazy. All right, I got. I have one good for a good tweet for you here. This I think this will explode your brain a little bit. All right. uh -oh. <laughs> you, you and I have already seen this one, but Treasury and Fed may have to come in and actually restrict the right as a U.S. citizen to pull money out of the U.S. banking sector due to capital flight from the U.S. banking system. This was Hugh Hendry said on B B Bloomberg. Remember, he also stated and showed that uh, in 1934, the Federal Reserve Act allowed it to confiscate gold from U.S. citizens. Yeah. This, of course, was right there during Bretton Woods when we debased off of the gold system. Now, you take that statement right there. We'll put that back on screen. You take that statement right there and you say, all right, wouldn't Bitcoin be in this of moving capital out of the U.S. system? Would we or do you think this becomes any sort of reality? Meaning that they would uh, take possession restrict. of your Bitcoin or restrict? Well, no, restrict, uh, restrict us yeah. from moving it. I, I would say that's always a risk. And I'll tell you, if they try to, good luck. And then secondly, it makes the value of Bitcoin go even higher. So well, you that's know, you the can one either, I think. Yeah, it, yeah it definitely you can embrace hits. it. You can embrace it as the solution to the Fiat Ponzi, which the U.S. needs to do. It's only mathematics because yeah. Bitcoin will, will replace U.S. treasuries as global reserve asset. I'm not mm. saying replacing the US dollar as global reserve currency, that's fine, but it will replace US treasury bonds as global reserve asset, in my opinion. Yeah, how do you think this plays out in terms of short selling bank stocks? Here was the, the point right here, May 4th, this was the ABA said, hey, Securities Exchange Commission expressing worry that short sellers might be manipulating markets. JP Morgan highlighted, never been a situation, perfectly healthy bank, ends up in hands of the FDIC. Uh, short sellers have been blamed for uh, stoking fears uh, leading in the significant. We talked about this before, 08, you know, done before. Is this something you think they'll actually uh, drive into uh, regulation? Yeah, highly likely. But then it just, it's one more reason that you would say, oh, there's the, the banking system is sound and resilient, is it? And now you're restricting short, short selling. Why? Well, maybe because you realize that the banking system isn't as sound and resilient as you right. are making it out to be. But more importantly, understand what short selling is in many cases. I used to be a credit default swap trader, as you know, you can use the common stock of a entity as a hedge against you selling protection. If someone's out there trying to buy protection on the debt, one of the ways you can hedge yourself is by shorting the equity yep. because the equity is a subordinate claim. If the debt's not worth a hundred cents on the dollar, the equity is worth zero. So 
that's part and parcel of an efficient market. And if the, the Fed is going to try and restrict that, it probably means, means that the credit default swap sellers of yep. protection leave, which means the price of default protection goes higher because there's no selling, which means mm -hmm. it becomes circular again. So, you know, you can try and put your finger in the dike of short selling on equities when you know, all you're going to do is call, cause a cascading impact. So, yeah. look, I am not bullish on the U.S. bank system. In fact, I just ran, a t I just sent out a tweet and ran some quick math on PacWest. PacWest has a market cap of less than $700 million right now. Right. It's got $44 billion of, mar of, uh, of uh, loans outstanding, assets. So, you can calculate what that leverage is. It's about 63 times, okay? to its market cap. It's levered 63 times to its market cap. That basically means assets, if they change by more than 2% or two out of $100, it's over. It's already yeah. over for PacWest, I'm sorry. Like I, maybe there's great people that work there. The market has lost confidence. It used to be worth, you know, billions of dollars in equity, which kept it in line on a risk adjusted basis with its total assets. But once that gets below a threshold, very tough to regain confidence of the market. What's the uh, outcome? Probably like First Republic, you know, there'll be a forced yeah. merger or taken into FDIC because it's only math again, Paul, when you get down to rounding errors amounts of capital based on a $44 billion loan book, things get yeah. ugly pretty quickly. Yeah, not a good look uh, for sure. Uh, further not a good look is this right here, data in on 45% uh, of oh. millennials now have more credit card debt. Let me zoom up on that just a hair for everybody. 44% of US adults now um, are aged 43 to 58 have more credit card debt than savings. That's not good. And then overall, 36% of U.S. adults now have more credit card debt than savings as well. So this is this is a, uh, I don't know that I've ever seen any kind of numbers like this in 25 years of, you know, in business, understanding dynamics around markets, and then in the technology sector. Um, this really spells, I mean, an implosion completely within the, the drawdown market in the essence of demand, meaning demand for anything, whether it's retail goods, any kind of yep. investment architecture, et cetera. How do you think this plays out in the next, say, 18 months? Well, for sure. Let's let's hit the elephant in the room first. Man, are those credit card guys ever horrible lenders, right? Like, I mean, do they not run proper credit checks? Is there is there not a way of checking so that the consumer's not that over levered? Because yep. you advance another credit card, essentially, for them to be able to pay the interest expense on the other four credit cards they have outstanding. Mm -hmm. Oh, who does that sound like? Well, it sort of sounds like the U.S. Treasury, but I'm not going to yep. go there right now. Okay, so you have the credit card debt where guys can't print their own money. Um, that being said, you know, there's there's oh, a credit card lending is very profitable as long as the consumer doesn't fail. When the consumer right. fails, credit uh, default sp uh, spike and skyrocket. What does it mean? Well, Credit gets withdrawn from the system. These people that are already over levered can't get any more access to debt to purchase more or to consume more. And as yep. you know, I, I mentioned GDP equals consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports. Well, consumption, that large uh, C in the equation, that's 70% of GDP. Yep. Damn, if you start, if that starts contracting, very hard for the other three terms in the equation to make up for the uh, uh, downfall in consumer spending. Uh, yes, it's dangerous. All right. So with that being the case, GDP is continuing to fall. We end up with higher inflation. Then you potentially get into a stagflationary scenario that Bingo. plays out. And how do you ever correct off this Again, I mean, it, you're, you have to devalue the currency to a, a point of no return. Essentially, you'd have to start printing again, even though you have high interest rates hence, and stagflation settings. Hence, Boom. hence uh, you're the man. As we said, QE infinity, it's the only solution. All no. outcomes lead to QE infinity, and thus all outcomes lead to fiat debasement, 
And that's all outcomes lead. Okay, look, I'm a Bitcoiner to Bitcoin or hard assets. <laughs> I'll leave it with that. Okay. Yeah. So all paths lead to hard assets of which the best hard asset that I'm aware of, it's called Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's take a look at what Jan, Janet Yellen said. This was, uh, I said this morning, President Biden presented a new detailed budget, uh, three trillion over 10 years to invest. I think it's going to be double that strength of the American economy. Uh, we need to raise the debt ceiling to avoid economic uh, calamity. So take a look at what she said. Well, really, that's it. We've been using extraordinary measures for several months now, and um, our ability to do that is running out, and we will start to run down our cash. And um, our current projection is that in early June, a day will come when we're unable to pay our bills unless Congress raises the debt ceiling. And it's something I strongly urge Congress um, to do. Of course, it's appropriate to have negotiations about the budget, about spending priorities. President Biden has presented a detailed budget that does cut deficits by $3 trillion over 10 years while investing uh, in the strength of the American economy. Um, but uh, we do need to raise the debt ceiling to avoid economic calamity. What would it what she probably should say is uh, economic collapse, because that, that essentially would be what we'd be facing. Obviously, this is not going to necessarily, I mean, it, it's not going to happen, but I do feel like we're going to see a, just a, a litany of concessions coming at it from the Congress uh, side that is very anti-raising the debt ceiling. Um, with this being the case, I mean, I, I mean, feel, to me, it just feels like this is a lot of fluff of nothing, because the real reality is, they're just going to turn on the printer and start the mo the money printing again. There's no real way out of this. Is there anything that they can do to try to e at least uh, postpone this for a few years? Or is this something you feel like is, this is a 2024 time bomb ticking? I, yeah, so they'll raise the debt ceiling by $1.2 trillion, uh, most likely, as you said. And then in eight months, they'll be back at the table to raise it again. again. Okay? I mean, yeah. this is just yeah. going to be like set your clock or set your watch by this. Why? Again, it's the interest expense on the debt that's going to that become the largest item. What's The total government debt is over $30 trillion. Interest rates are 3%. That means that the interest expense portion is growing at over a trillion dollars a year, right? Three, right, right. 30 trillion times 3% or three and a half percent, which is the U S 10 year rate. That's interest expense. Then you add on entitlements and then you add on, um, uh, military spending. Biden's not going to uh, uh, cut the deficit by $3 trillion. It's mathematically impossible unless the USA wants to go into deep depression. Because again, I'll throw out the equation of the day. GDP equals consumption plus investment plus G. What does G stand for? Government spending. Okay, cut yeah. that down. And all of a sudden, everything else, GDP contracts. And as a portion of your debt burden... You have contraction in your GDP because of government spending. It's over that way. So either it's over because of the consumer. It's over because of net exports. It's over because of government spending. It's over people. Like, I don't know why we're splitting hairs and trying to thread this needle. So the only solution is continue to print money. The deficit is out of control. You will never bring it back into control because we've lost, we've lost that ability mathematically. And just a little comment on, on Secretary Yellen there. I mean, all due respect to a nice old lady, she's got to go. Grandma, you're not yeah. doing anybody <laughs> any favors. Go out and start yeah. watering your petunias. Get somebody in there that actually is honest and credible and can actually do mathematics. Oh, my gosh. You know, if that happened, though, Greg, that would scare the American people beyond. It probably here. would, wouldn't it? It, it, it probably would. I mean, if, would. If they actually just... told the truth besides that. I mean, come on. How Let's, else do uh, you address a problem then? So I guess you don't well, you tell have the to American face people. It. Yeah, you yeah, have you, to face you, it. you gaslight them or you teach them about this beautiful thing called Bitcoin, which is their own <laughs> self-protection. OK, that's that that's their own self-protection against grandma and uh, federal uh, Fed Reserve Chairman. Uh, Jerome Powell, who, by the way, once again, had a horrible press conference and very poor at 
you know, lying. He knows he's lying. He's <laughs> well, bluffing. I mean, the optics and he's a horrible were terrible. Bluffer. Oh, yeah, it's the just, optics it's were so terrible. Sad because, yeah, Paul, you know, the people that and... he's penalizing are my kids. All right. Yeah. Like, you know, you are stealing from the future of my children. And that's they just no unacceptable. They have no problem. Unfortunately, with that. it seems like they don't. Yeah. All right. Buffett turns gloomy. Incredible period. His quote uh, for the U.S. economy is coming to an end. Uh, he's, so this was his Berkshire Hathaway of uh, earnings. Majority of the conglomerates operations to fall this year. Majority of the businesses will report lower earnings than last year during the last six months. The incredible period for the U.S. economy has been coming to an end. So he sees the writing on the wall. He sees it in the banking sector, the retail sector, and the business sector, B2B, you name it. Every sector out there is getting ready to take a full frontal assault. And uh, this is a challenge because when you look at the U.S. economy and it, its position in the global environment, let's talk about that. How does this affect the European zone? If you look at the EU, how does this affect the Middle East? And then you go into the Pacific Rim. Is there any winner that comes out of this right now? In the short term, you know, that net exports uh, uh, fourth fourth term in your GDP, some, uh, some countries may... Uh, uh, succeed in increasing their exports. Specifically, I'm not talking about a G20 nation, but right. let's say a Russia, excuse me, a China. You know, China is very good at net exports, but they have their own banking crisis over there. Yeah. Um, what it does mean is very simply this. Um, Buffett admits there's no solution. Like, it's just, it's yeah. really sad. Did you see it's when that young girl asked him the question about the USA losing reserve currency status. Yeah, that was a fan. fumbled was over the answer. Yeah, I know it's beautiful old. that she asked the question. What is pathetic is his answer beating around the bush. A lot of yeah. word salad. Like guys, this is I look again. Respect to Mr. Buffett. He's ninety two years old. Time to move on. Uh, he's done a great job. It. If you don't see the writing on the wall, and they do largely because they're selling banks, they're just not mm -hmm. going into the thing that will solve the debt spiral, what? which is Bitcoin. Why do you think that is? Because I feel like these guys, if they were to pivot on Bitcoin yeah. or digital assets or anything, I think people would look at them and say, all right, these guys have got new information, so you change your mind. I love it. And yeah. th there's nothing wrong with that. That's a good investor. Wow. And I, I just don't understand why they can't take that step into the neck just because they've been so adamant about this uh, digital economy. Perhaps, perhaps it's because they're 92 and they don't want to go out as the, you know, their final statement the to the flopper. public is, uh, is <laughs> well, not a flip flop, because as you say, you're allowed to change your mind as, the, as or change your thesis change. as the, the facts change. That is the mark of a good investor. Don't be like Peter Schiff. I mean, Peter Schiff could have been the <laughs> best performing gold fund in the world if he yeah. had just put 1% of his gold assets into Bitcoin when Bitcoin was 10 bucks because that's when yeah. he was first told about Bitcoin. Anyway, leaving Peter Schiff aside, it's very hard for investors to admit a cognitive bias. And I think that's what Charlie and, and uh, Warren have largely. For, don't forget for the longest time, they told people they were not tech investors. They preferred right. to sell sugar yeah. syrup, you know, cola, Coca-Cola or Apple, uh, chocolates sure. and all this stuff rather than owning tech. Now they're the largest owner, one of the largest owners of Apple stock. That's okay. They changed their, their thesis there. They I don't did. anticipate they'll change their thesis on uh, Bitcoin because they view it as anti-American, which in fact, it's not. It's pro-American because it's mm -hmm. actually pro-freedom. But Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett are, bas are past their best before date. That's unfortunate, but that's only mathematics as well. Um, you know, maybe the, the successor, I can't remember what his name was, Abel or something like that, or Adele, uh, the success right. for, successor yeah, for, for Berkshire, Berkshire Hathaway. Hathaway. Yep. Maybe he'll change his mind and it'll take pressure off of Charlie and Warren. But again, you have to continue. I like your statement. A good risk manager changes his the his or her thesis as the information changes. Absolutely. Fidelity, Bank of America, indirect exposure now to Bitcoin through MicroStrategy. This is uh, good news. Yeah. Bank of America and Fidelity both. Don't forget that. There's, that's their yeah. That's their asset management side though. Yep. So don't. That would be their asset management arm. They're doing that on behalf of clients. Uh, it's not like the bank is embracing it per se. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, Fidelity for sure, 
But Fidelity is out there with good, very solid Bitcoin research that I always say, okay, look, I think I've said on your show, my Bitcoin target price in today's dollars is 2 million US dollars per Bitcoin. Okay. And people will be like, Foss, you're crazy. And I go, no, no, I've run the math. I'll show you how I get to that number. And then I say, okay, well, if you don't believe me, how about you look at Fidelity's research, their target price for Bitcoin, granted it's in the year 2030 is 10 million bucks per Bitcoin. All right. Well, look how they got there is based on adoption of technologies like cell phones and internet comparison. Now, it doesn't stop there. Do you know what their price target in 2040 for Bitcoin is? What was it? Over a billion per oh, Bitcoin. Okay. All right. Okay, well, so look, go. let's start. We'll, we'll, we'll go through 2 million before we get to 10 million, and then we'll see what 10 million is. Again, mine is in today's dollars, but don't overthink the fact that MicroStrategy, yes, it's got Bitcoin exposure, but... It's also a technology business with free cash flow, whereas Bitcoin is a commodity, no counterparty risk that you can also own via custody uh, or cold storage from Fidelity. Yeah. So I really like what Fidelity is doing. Um, uh, Yuri and Timmer over there at uh, Fidelity, I really like his research. Just at least consider this stuff. And if you had to ask me to pick between Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett and Fidelity. I'm afraid oh, yeah. I'm going with Fidelity. Okay, Fidelity, that's just the yeah. way it is. Yeah, I think the we've we've reported on Fidelity pretty heavily. Uh, you know, I would love to see them open up their capability of in and out. You know, in the ask, especially yeah. in Bitcoin and ETH. So yeah. that's something. A couple of uh, last tweets here. I wanted to get your opinion on this. Was breaking Binance outflow data confirms largest withdrawal in history. Over 162,000 Bitcoin left the exchange. At about 4.6 billion, it could be people going to hardcore wallets mainly because of what we've seen yep. with these transaction yep. moves. Um, but it also could be meaning some people setting up. Obviously, Bitcoin now uh, clipping into the 27k range. Any thoughts on on? I know you're not an exchange person; it's self custody all the way. But any thoughts on that of people who are saying, "Hey, I'm ready to move to self custody or move to an alternative solution." There's uh, concerns over uh, Binance for a number of reasons, including the fact that uh, many people question whether they actually hold the Bitcoin or if they've sold you paper Bitcoin. Uh, uh, so that's good good risk management that you start taking your Bitcoin yeah. off of their exchange when you can. <laughs> um, you know, this weekend they halted withdrawals because they blamed it on network congestion. Yes, Sunday evening. That's just yep, such Sunday a evening. that is just such a, a fake out. Okay. Uh, what they haven't done well is what's called UTXO management, uh, which is consolidating their transactions. I don't want to get too granular and I can't say I'm an expert on that side, but I listen to the guys that are smart about this. There's just a lot of stuff to understand about the Bitcoin blockchain and small transactions versus large, large transactions. Um, that concerns me that Binance is the global player in the, in a crypto exchange. And I say crypto even mm -hmm. though I'm only Bitcoin, I only focus on Bitcoin. Bitcoin is traded on Binance. And uh, yeah, it's good that people are withdrawing it. I think that's very smart. Yeah. What Last I'm point. concerned with. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. No, well, no I'm just saying concerned? what I'm concerned with, if they don't, if they don't have the actual Bitcoin, the people that are selling early, there's an old adage. He who yep. panics first panics best. Okay. Bingo. And the people that are now selling are, could be the ones that are smart. Or yeah, not selling, yeah. but take withdrawing, withdrawing. Yeah, withdrawing. Well, that that just means they're most likely going on to cold storage. Uh, last yeah. point here, and I think this is an interesting one because it could be a shift of power in terms of mass adoption. And if you look at Coinbase, possibly the situation with Binance getting a little bit uh, unusual. Fidelity here for the United States. Coinbase comes in and says they're considering UAE as a potential crypto international hub. Obviously, that could open up Coinbase for a more international play for trading Bitcoin and other assets. Okay. But what are your thoughts on, on American companies that have been very successful here so far saying, all right, man, we, we feel like this is really a challenge. Uh, we've got to hedge our bets in the international markets. It would be unfortunate, despite the fact that, again, I'm not a huge cryptocurrency platform. Technology is technology. 
Um, it's, it brings jobs to America. It brings innovation to America. And if you get them offshoring that innovation, that ultimately decreases your, uh, your competitiveness and your competitive advantage. Um, I, I will only say this, okay. As a Canadian, and I always say also living in the attic of the United States rent free. Okay. Cause most of you guys can't even find Canada on a map. So I'm lucky. <laughs> I'm your grumpy uncle. I'm your grumpy uncle, Greg, living in your attic rent free. Uh, I need you guys to survive. Okay. Because Canada is just a rounding <laughs> error. We're not even as important as the, as the state of California in terms of global GDP, even though we yeah. are a G seven nation, I need the USA to survive. Why? Because you're the bastion of freedom that will defend freedom globally, including for Canada. Okay. And if you start losing your most important technological technology companies and your, your advantage of free markets, free and open markets, damn, that's going to be upsetting because I love the United States. Okay. I've been to school there. I have plenty of friends. I love, I've worked in the, in New York. I will only say this. Please, America, open your eyes and understand that Bitcoin is actually your friend. Because the system that you are relying on is now broken and you need to fix it. And Bitcoin is the solution. Yeah, we'll end on that, Greg. I want to go to our uh, poll real quick and see what the audience says today. Since there's a live one, let's take a look. And what do we got? All right, should the US ban short selling? This is back to the bank uh, scenario. Uh, people are back in the uh, in the, the boat of no, not gonna happen. So these are pro Good. traders. Yeah. But that's also freedom. You're expressing yeah. your viewpoint. What if you're wrong? What if yeah. in fact the banks are such a solid investment that anybody short selling them is gonna get their face ripped off? Mm-hmm. Good. At least, you know, <laughs> you're market. allowed to lose money. It makes a free yeah. market. Anyway, market. Uh, thanks for having me, Paul. Yeah, As always, always I love you. Yeah, I love your insight. And go America. Okay, come on. <laughs> Be proud, people. America the beautiful and the land of the free. I like it. I like it. We'll end on that one, Greg. Thanks again for stopping in today. We appreciate it. Take care. Thank you, sir. All right. So, of course, you guys, don't forget, uh, if you're not part of our Diamond Circle, get in. That's another way for you guys to get not only uh, indicators from us, but also additional content. We do podcasts over there, audio casts, which don't end up on our podcast streams, but are only available for our newsletter subscribers, which is the Diamond Circle. So make sure to join. Just click that link down below. If you want to hit me up, it's out there on Twitter, at Paul, Paul Barron. Let me know, if, by the way, if you're going out to uh, the Bitcoin Miami conference, DM me. I'd love to uh, shake some hands. So great to see you guys. We'll catch you next time right here on TechBath.